going to mug me. I'm not going to mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. world, airports are abuzz with thousands of passengers passing through their terminals each day. And from endless emotional journeys come countless stories. Heartwarming reunions. When I see him for the first time, I'm going to run over and hug him, of course. I mean, I'm dying to see him. Tales of discovery. If I hadn't lost my sight, I probably wouldn't be the person I am now. And inspirational journeys. We've had three years. Yeah. And three years that we were told by the medical community we wouldn't have. This is Dublin Airport, and these are their stories. Welcome to one of the top 10 busiest airports in Europe, Dublin Airport. Emotional reunions and tearful goodbyes are all part of the course here, as we find out tonight as we reveal the true stories from behind the terminals. For many, travelling is a happy and exciting time. But for others, it can seem like a daunting experience. Here at Dublin Airport, it is the responsibility of the OCS to provide the necessary help to those who need assistance. We've been here since 2008, providing services to passengers with reduced mobility. We help all people from all walks of life, and the feedback we get from them is very, very positive. From elderly people going on their first journey overseas, to uh, people with uh, sight problems, hearing issues, and like that, we're here to help. An airport for an able-bodied person can be a very frightening and intimidating place. Uh, wide open spaces and really people can get lost, but that's where we offer, because our staff are aware of the airport, we offer them comfort and assurance, and it's so gratifying. But again, people just need confidence going through the airport. If they are, have uh, hearing difficulties or sight problems, we can actually show them, escort them through the airport. One of the care assistants on hand to help people through the airport is Frank, who's waiting on his next passenger to arrive. Well, the passenger today that we have is uh, visually impaired. Um, we assist all manners of uh, passengers with reduced mobility. Uh, but today, the job that we have is a blind passenger, and I will take him uh, to check in. Uh, I will take him down through security. If he needs to, if he needs to buy anything in duty free. We take them all the way through there. We would then proceed to the boarding gate, and when we get them to there, we would then board them. We would board. We would complete the, We would complete the task really from from the car from the car door to the aircraft door. Without the OCS, how difficult would it be for a blind person to get through the airport? Well, there are many obstacles within the airport. Uh, as you can see, the amount of passengers that we have. Um, there's lifts to contend with, escalators. Then we have to go through security through the shopping area, through the, through the, the loop upstairs. Uh, there's lifts downstairs through the boarding gates, and then uh, there, there would be quite a lot of people on that area, on the concourse, uh, at the boarding gates. So it is a, it is a hard task for a pa passenger with, um, who is visually impaired to make it to the gate. Robert Dalry, are you happy enough? Yeah. Robbie is availing of this service today as he makes his way through the airport on his journey to Austria. OCS, they're very helpful, they're grand. They just, all I need is an elbow, they walk through with me. And they give you a good elbow? No, they will a good elbow. And any lip out of them, I give them a good elbow back, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you said that you've, you've only a little bit of vision. Have you, when did you lose your sight? Uh, when I was 13. So you remember having full vision? Oh, yeah. So, Robbie, you're going on a big flight today. Something very exciting is happening? Absolutely. Um, my friend's getting married tomorrow, up on the side of a mountain and a big church down in the Tyrolean mountains of San Johan in Austria. And are you going to ski down the mountain? Mm, I will do at some stage, before I have a few drinks anyway. Tell us a little about your skiing, you're very good at it. Um, I started skiing after I lost my sight in 2001. 
maybe if I hadn't lost my sight, I wouldn't have started skiing. I might have been too afraid of the height of it. But um, I started skiing with the National Council for the Blind in 2001. It's great. We'd ski from half ten in the morning to three o'clock and then straight down and ski right into the beer garden of a place called Max's Pub. Tell us how that works. How does the ski instructor guide you? Basically, the two of us get off the ski lift as we start. I have a bit of sight, so he's about six feet, eight feet in front of me. And then, as he continues on, he would uh, shout back to me and um, tell me to turn either right or left mm -hmm. out of the way of obstacles. For Robbie, these trips abroad are made easier through the health and the support of the OCS. It's a free service. We work with the DAA on behalf of their uh, customer airlines. At our peak in the summer months, we can handle over a thousand passengers with reduced mobility. Uh, we provide the service both here in Ireland and the UK, and even last year alone, we handled over a million passengers with reduced mobility at the airports where we service. So we do recommend to passengers that they pre-advise their airline at least 36 hours in advance, then in turn the airline advises us, so therefore we're ready to, uh, to meet the needs of the passenger, whether they come actually into the airport from the drop-off point outside, the coach area or the taxi area, and equally when flights arrive in to Dublin Airport, we're aware of their arrival, we meet the flight, we're there when the doors open, and then take them through to the baggage reclaim, to customs, and then onward to their onward journey. Obviously, you had friends that knew you before you lost your sight oh, and friends yeah. after. Did anybody treat you different, Robbie? Um, not friends, no. But with people I wouldn't have been close to, I suppose, would have. But it's only because it's, it wouldn't be a patronising thing. Um, it'd be more so people are the fear of the unknown. They don't know what to say. You know, and I probably would have been the same myself before I lost my sight. Well, I'm not sure because I was so young when it happened to me, you know. Mm. If I hadn't lost my sight, I probably wouldn't be the person who I am now. I'm quite happy with the person who I am now. I wouldn't be skiing if I hadn't lost my sight. I'm skiing now. Mm. Okay, I can't drive a car or, you know, a motorbike or anything like that. But then again, you know, you have to think about it this way. If I hadn't lost my sight, would I have crashed that car? Crashed that bike? Would I be dead? Would I have went down the wrong road and not been conscious of, you know, health and stuff like that? Well, you obviously love travelling because you've been away so much. Isn't it so important what the OCS do here in the airport? Absolutely, yeah. No, they're a great service. They're brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. They're very nice as well. Very uh, genuine down-to-earth people. And they're not reluctant. Obviously, you know, well, it's probably because they're dealing with people with disabilities and elderly people and stuff like that all the time that they, um, they wouldn't be reluctant to crack a joke or say anything like that. You know, I wouldn't feel, and I've spoken to other people that are visually impaired, wouldn't feel that um, they're walking around that you know on eggshells around you, mm. you know. So uh, like that guy Frank, he walked me through earlier on. We were having to crack all the way through, like you know. He said um, he basically said there was a girl up ahead, and um, she was good looking. And I said, I oh, know, I see what I want to see, Frank. I know you've got a flight to catch. Um, have a great time at the wedding. Thanks a million. Some session at the wedding. Ah, no, I don't really party to be honest. Like you know, I'm quite a teetotaler. I just have tea really and water and stuff, you know? Yeah, there'd be just a few prayer meetings. That's maybe a bag of chips on the way home or something yeah. like that, you know, but no, 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 I wouldn't really. No, blind drunk can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> it was lovely meeting you, and I'm delighted that you had Frank today to bring you through. Yeah, thanks a million. Good to talk to you. You too. And as Robbie prepares to leave for his journey ahead, up in arrivals, a couple have just landed from America. My name is Gary. And I'm Cappy. And we're the Johnses, and we're from uh, Post Falls, Idaho, outside of Spokane, Washington. Always wanted to come to Ireland, and this was our opportunity. So we seized the opportunity, and we're going to spend a week here. I understand it's about two hours south of Dublin called Powers Court at the Ritz-Carlton. So we're going to, we have a nice little package, and we're going to go down there and spend a full week down there with some friends of ours that are also flying in from Los Angeles. They were here last year, and they stayed at Powers Court, where we'll be staying. And they bragged about it so much, and they brought all these pictures to show us. So I said, well, if you guys are going to go back, let us know. And in December, he called one day and said, hey, 
we're going to go. So we immediately got on this, uh, this trip, decided to come. For both Kathy and Gary, this trip has a special significance. We came on this vacation to Ireland. My wife is three years free of cancer, and this is our way of celebrating it. And we thought this would be a perfect place to come. Gary have recently arrived from America on a week-long visit to Ireland to celebrate Kathy's health and well-being. Kathy was diagnosed with a rare form of terminal cancer back in 2009. It was absolutely devastating for me. I was very broken and um, I was going to go in for a trial for some medication and then they found some swollen lymph nodes and it kicked me out of the trial so I had absolutely no hope. There were no options. The option was to remove the cancer and that's pretty much all they could do. Um, there is some medications that they can give you to slow it down but basically it's you know five years maybe and that's it. Well when she first came home uh, we weren't sure what it was going to be and then when the first diagnosis was it was a tumor and then they showed us the pictures of the tumor and the tumor was so massive and it just kept snowballing. There was just one thing after another. The first surgeon we went to wanted to delay surgery for six weeks. That was, that was unacceptable so a six week delay wasn't going to work. We got into another surgeon who was extremely talented and he, he saw us on Tuesday and the following Sunday. I was at the hospital and I really had, had not come to grips with it, but I knew that the conversation when they came out might be that she's not going to make this. Uh, and when he came out with this smile like he was a child at Christmas and told me that her spleen was fine and her pancreas was fine and she was going to be fine, I just fell into a chair. I couldn't believe that everything went the opposite the way the medical community thought it would. And good Lord took over and she's fine. She was fine then, she's, three years later, she's still fine. Well, for me, um, I had no other hope. I had nowhere to turn. I, I turn to God. Every day is a blessing. Every day that he has given me is an absolute blessing. So never give up hope. Every year, the couple now travel in celebration of Kathy's continued good health. I snuck out of work to do this. Uh, hope I don't get caught. Uh, but it's, it, it was an opportunity to sit there and realize and appreciate we've had three years. Yeah. And three years that we were told by the medical community we wouldn't have. Yeah. So and we've got it. Looking forward to their holiday in Ireland, the couple head to arrivals to meet with their friends accompanying them on their trip. Downstairs at check-in, I meet another lady who's been through a similar experience. So Judy, tell us why you're at the airport today with your mum. I'm bringing my mum uh, on a holiday to France because she's wanted to go to France for a long time. And I've been she's, a couple of years ago. She's but... recovered from lung cancer from a couple of years ago, so she hasn't been able Stop. to... Well, I did ask you. <laughs> I told you no. <laughs> so she hasn't been able to fly anywhere for a while. Uh, so this is a big treat for the two of us. Uh, yeah. So we're going for three nights to Cannes uh, with the travel department. Has yeah. it been a tough time for you recently? Well, I can't garden. I'd be able, not able to walk very far. Things I like doing. Yeah. I haven't even had to swim, you know. So. Little things. Yeah, silly little things. Oh, well, what's going to be great is you're going to have three days of enjoyment. And heat, I hope, a little bit of sun. And is it nice for mum and daughter to go away together? Yeah, we've we've great. done quite a bit of it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. When husband was sick a year ago, we used to go off every so often just to get a break. There's a special bond, I think, between mum and daughter oh, yeah. that can never... Every mother should have a daughter. Oh, absolutely. No Once you have a daughter, you'll never be alone. No. And what made you choose this particular service? We used it previously, about six years ago, um, before mum was sick, and it was great, um, because it means then you don't... Because, as you know yourself, you have an awfully long way to walk, 
and when you're not that mobile it makes it a bit more difficult so it makes it much more relaxing yeah, very much um, so, yeah. just to be able to know that mum's looked after and we'll get right up to the airport and up to the airplane and just get on so it'll be great well you look the picture of health thank you very much have a wonderful time ladies thank you, thank you very much enjoy your flight you. yeah. as judy and her mother head for departures i meet noelle and her son dylan who are also using the ocs service Noelle, tell us why you're using the OCS service here in Dublin Airport today. Um, I requested the OCS service, I didn't know much about it, but I had looked into different options to help me get through the airport as quickly as possible, to help my son Dylan who has autism. We've flown together on our own a lot, and he's generally a very good flyer, he loves the airplane, but doesn't always understand the waiting involved at the airport. So. Um, I saw that we could get assistance kind of fast track through security, immigration, just generally in check-in. So uh, it's the first time I've used the service, so we'll see how it goes. When you found out about the service, was it a great relief for you as a mother, knowing that totally. there's a little extra help? Totally, yeah. I went on the website, they actually even had autism specifically mentioned, and a lot of the tools you can employ, which I already do, like visual supports, and we, I make special books for him in advance to prepare him at every airport we go to. Um, but it was just good that it's, there's just so much more awareness and then the general services for anybody with reduced mobility, etc. It's, it's really a wonderful service. And for Dylan, is it the amount of people that are here that upset him? No, it's, it's, I think it's frustration with waiting and he's so excited by... You know, they say if you know one child with autism, you know one child with autism. Every single one of them are different and individual. And, um, for Dylan, he's so excited by the airplane that he just wants to go right on the airplane. Every gate he sees, he wants to walk on that airplane. So it's just, um, and then he can get frustrated, etc. So. And what exactly are they going to do for you today, Noel? They're going to help me get through uh, the lines at bag drop off, at security, and then at immigration, because we clear immigration for New York here in Dublin. So it's just like, you know, three sets of waiting lines just makes the waiting at the gate that much harder. So if we can fast track through there, then I can kind of manage uh, manage the waiting at the other end of the gate with you know the iPad and the books and the snacks and all of that. And I know you're from New York and you're over visiting your parents. I'm actually from Dublin. I've lived in New York for about 16, 17 years now and just back visiting family and my parents here, yeah. And do you miss Ireland now that you've been home for a week? Does it make you want to come home or maybe live here? I miss the people. Yeah. I do love New York though. <laughs> I love my life in New York, but I do miss all the people in Ireland. Yeah. And do you find that there's good services for Excellent. Dylan in New York? Yeah. yeah. New York is the best place for him right now. Yeah, I've heard that it's a mm -hmm. centre of excellence actually for autism. Yeah. Absolutely. Which is yeah. fantastic. Excellent, he's excellent teachers. I'm still homeschooling him and a whole battery of therapists and teachers and uh, they're all wonderful. Well, I know time is of the essence for you. I know you're waiting to get through swiftly, so I won't delay you, but have a very safe trip. Thank you very much. And Dylan, it was lovely to meet you. Have a great trip, Dylan. Enjoy it. Can you say thank you? Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Up in arrivals, Kathy and Gary's friends have landed, and the couples meet up for the first time on Irish soil. Larry and I went to work together uh, about 40 years ago, and so we've known each other a long, long time, and he's the godfather to, to the oldest kids, and he's just a great guy. His wife's a wonderful lady, and we're just a real, you know, we're really two couples that get along really, really well. We're have a good time. And it'll be a great vacation for a week. What do you plan to do here? A lot of rest and relaxation. <laughs> yeah. The Guinness Brewery, yeah. a lot more rest and relaxation, and maybe we'll go back to the Guinness Brewery. We're just going to enjoy Ireland, enjoy the countryside, yeah, and beautiful. spend a week. Yeah, that's rain what we're going to do. Beach. We brought our rain gear, and we don't <laughs> care if it rains. We're just happy to be here. Oh, yeah. So we're just, we're we couldn't be any happier. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how you appreciate the little things now? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You really do. Yeah. But when you go through something traumatic, like we've gone through uh, this issue, you have a better appreciation for the good life that the Lord has given us and take every advantage of it. Take every advantage of it. And have your friends been very supportive, Kathy, of this? And are they helping you to get through it? And oh, absolutely. Everybody's been really, really supportive. And yeah, so we're all celebrating, I think. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Everybody. It's a, it's a celebration all the way around. Yeah.
every day thousands of passengers and their families descend on Dublin Airport. And these terminals are brimming with accounts of faraway journeys and exploits. In T2 arrivals, an anxious mother waits on the arrival of her son. I'm here today to um, meet my son who's coming in from Dubai. I, he's been there for a year and uh, I'm dying to see him, just miss him. He was on the dole here and um, he did three internships hoping he might get work from it. He absolutely didn't like being out of work. He had been in Australia previously and came back just as the crash was happening. And eventually after a year on the dole, he said, I'm out of here, I'm going somewhere and getting some work. So friends of his were going to Dubai, so he went out to Dubai and it's worked out very well for him. Patrick's a bit of a mixed career. He was originally in event management, but did train as a journalist. And after being in Australia, he decided he wanted to concentrate on the journalist side. So he had the, the problem of not really having much miles under his belt in sports journalism, which in Dubai, he was taken on one of the sports papers and has flown ever since. He loves it. And, you know, maybe eventually would come back here or to England when he has more experience. It was hard for him on the dole, um, and it was hard for me. I hate watching young people because you're afraid that it'll become a habit being on the dole, that not working could become a habit when you're sort of that young. I mean, not that he's that young, he's 27 now, but he, he definitely hated being on the dole and tried everything he could, you know, he really did. In fact, he didn't really believe he wouldn't be able to get a job. He, you know, he ended up just defeated by it, and that's why he left. I know some young people really, really don't want to go, and if they feel they absolutely have to, then that is very sad, or people with families who don't want to move with their family. But I think for a young lad who's single, who's fancy free, the world is a big place, why not go and see some of it? So I'm in two minds. As a mother, I hate him being gone, but I think for himself, it'll be a great experience. Passengers arriving in Dublin Airport are closely scrutinised as they pass through the terminals. One responsibility of customs is to protect our borders from illegal drugs, cigarette smuggling and other substances. Our role at the airport is, is, is vital. If you take last year alone, we seized over six million worth of uh, uh, narcotics attempting to be smuggled into the country. In the area of cigarettes, we seized upwards of nearly 20, 20 million cigarettes alone coming in at the airport. Some days there'll be equivalent of uh, a full house at Crow Park moving through the in and out through the airport, and that's what our officers have to deal with. Most of them, I must stress, are legitimate passengers going about their holidays or business or anything else without infringing any rules or breaking any laws, and we have to have respect for that. Revenue Customs Service is continuously uh, monitoring what type of technology is available to assist us uh, and to make us do, may help officers to do their job easier. For instance, x-ray machines, ion scan machines for swabbing uh, baggage or floating of people uh, or consignments of goods to see if there's a presence of a narcotic. Another tool we have at the airport is uh, our dog unit. This is made up of four dogs, two drug dogs, a cash dog and a, a tobacco dog. Uh, again, they're a tool, they're used to try and, on baggage and on persons, uh, to try and de detect illicit drugs, large amounts of cash being imported or export, and also to, to detect cigarettes, large-scale smuggling of cigarettes. It's uh, hugely important to have dog teams um, both at the airports and the ports around the country. They do a huge amount of work. They can screen a huge amount of uh, baggage, uh, passengers, cargo, freight. The dogs are trained on specific uh, scents, uh, and when the dog picks up uh, one of those scents, then the dog gives a passive reaction, which is generally a sit and stare or a stand and stare type reaction for our dogs. The dog handler's role is a very pressurised job. They're on call 24-7 uh, uh, days a week, uh, except when they're on holidays. Um, so it's a very intensive role, and they uh, have a lot of responsibilities, not just to the dog, but to themselves, and um, to the other officers around here as well. 
uh, there's a huge amount of pressure on them for results, uh, as there is with well, all our customs officers. We have targets to meet on an annual basis. So it's a very pressurised, uh, very pressurised job. Uh, and the type of job it is, we even though you come in in the morning and you may have a plan of what you expect to happen between the hours of your of your roster, uh, the reality is that this job changes every day, uh, changes from hour to hour, sometimes from minute to minute. Uh, it's a very rewarding job, but it's also a very challenging job, and you need to be able to think on your feet uh, and react accordingly. Today, the officers are conducting routine checks when they're alerted to a flight about to land from Warsaw. There's a known passenger on board who's suspected of carrying a high volume of cigarettes. Meanwhile, back in the arrivals hall, Jean continues to wait on her son, Patrick. Every mother misses their children. You know, I have a daughter away at boarding school, so I'm bereft of children. Um, yes, I miss my son being there. Uh, he actually was living in Dublin, I'd moved down the country, but we did used to go up and see each other and he'd come down to me and we'd go out for dinner and have good chats. I still remember saying goodbye to him um, when he went off the first time because of course you're always afraid when they go out into the world that he'd maybe never come back and live in Ireland again. Obviously I hope he will, but it is the risk you take when they go off and you know, I'd prefer him to be in Ireland for my sake, but for his sake it's different. When I see him for the first time, I'm going to run over and hug him, of course. Um, I mean, I'm dying to see him, you know. I see you're wearing the green. <laughs> My son has just come through the gate. I'm absolutely thrilled to see him. His hair is longer. Glad to see he's wearing green, keeping the end up. What can I say? He's gorgeous. He's my son. <laughs> Every mother would say the same. I left Ireland basically because there was no jobs. Um, extremely difficult to find work. I was doing interviews for internships um, and there was queues out the door for the internships, which I found bizarre. Um, and after about six months of that, got sick of it. A friend had gone over to Dubai and kind of told me all about it and I said, look, you know, nothing to lose at this stage. So yeah, went over, that was over a year ago and uh, haven't regretted it since. There is a void with him not being here in Ireland. Um, you know, I definitely, I miss him all the time. I think of him regularly, why wouldn't I kind of thing. But I'm glad for him that he's getting on with it. And I think at the moment, Ireland has nothing to offer him. So I'm glad he's making it somewhere else. In terms of the future, look, you never know what's going to happen. I would like to think I would come back here and settle. But the way the country is at the moment, who knows what's going to happen. I, could, I, I couldn't move back here tomorrow, let's put it that way, because, you know, things seem to be really bad here. Um, and there's no getting away from that. It's unfortunate, I think, we will pull ourselves out of it. I think it might take a little bit longer than people expect. But for the moment, my home is in Dubai, but I'd never sell there. In the arrivals hall, a big welcome sign catches my eye. So, Daniel, are you involved in the church here in Ireland? Yes, I am. Yeah, it's a Calvary Bible Baptist Church in Bray, and we are a, this is the, the church is coming in. Group of uh, people from their youth group who decided to come. They're gonna so we're gonna take around Dublin, out there to Glendalough, and and uh, down into Waterford and look around the country for a little while. So as you work in the church, um, it's a youth group, so are these young people that these, are coming It's over? actually like a Christian high school in the States, and they're coming over just on their spring break, but they know us because they, um, their church actually supports us here, so that's how we know them. So you yep. kind of, it's like a twin, you twin in a with sense, sort of exactly. In a sense, a partnering yep. thing. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Now, Daniel, I want to ask you about your particular job. Are you a pastor, are you? Yeah, I'm a missionary pastor. I am, yeah. Yep. So I'm a joint minister of the Word of God. So and, what does uh, that entail? You're out in Bray, and, and what does that entail? Well, our, it entails sharing the Word of God with people because Jesus Christ said uh, He was the way, the truth, and the life, and then no one could go uh, see the kingdom unless they were born again. So our, our desire is to help people know uh, Jesus Christ personally. And so uh, uh, there's more to uh, Christianity than just a name. Yeah. 
That's and Christ. And so we're, uh, we're exposing people to the truth. And do you find that Ireland is a spiritual place? Was there a reason why you came to Ireland? Other than the fact that this is just where the Lord wanted us, that's why we came. It's amazing. That is, it is. And I love the people here, and I see the great, great need for them. They're wonderful people, but like everywhere, they need the Lord. So whether here or somewhere else, this is where we're planted for now. It's fantastic. I think there's actually been a huge falling away from Christ uh, throughout Ireland. I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of problems in, the, in religious circles, a lot of uh, moral decay. And I think people, really not just here, but around the world, are, are suffering from that. They need to see that Christ hasn't changed, yeah. His Word hasn't changed. And so our heart's desire is to get, let them see that there, there really is uh, uh, hope. Something tells me when a group of 16 teenagers walk through, we're not going to miss them. I hope them. so. <laughs> I, I hope so. You shouldn't miss a thing. How long are they staying here for? They've been over nine days. Nine days. Well, we're going to keep an eye out because I certainly don't want to miss their arrival. Okay. <laughs> Customs are always on high alert and aware of passengers using foreign flights to smuggle large amounts of cheap tobacco to sell on Ireland's black market. Officers have received intelligence that a known passenger has arrived off a flight from Warsaw. They suspect that he may be trying to smuggle tobacco into the country. It's up to the team to stop and question the gentleman and carry out a more in-depth search. Did you pack this bag yourself? Yep. OK. How long were you out of the country for? How long were you out of the country? How long? Yeah. When did you go to Warsaw? When? Yeah. Uh, two days ago. Two oh, days sure. ago. Did you pass with your piece, sir? Are your identification card? Yeah, yeah. Of course. This is, um... Thank you very much. No, sir, have you ever been stopped by customs before? No. No. How many cigarettes do you have? Uh, 18. 18? One eight. One eight boxes? Yes. OK, and can I have a quick look at that bag there? Yeah. Did you travel alone? Yeah. And who did belong to Boots? This is for my sister. More cigarettes, sir. Okay, I just want to take you into one of our rooms, okay? This is one of many discoveries that customs make on a daily basis and time will tell what actions the officer will take. Up in arrivals, the wait is finally over. The Woodcrest Parish Youth Group has arrived. Welcome to Ireland. You're just off the plane. How was your flight? Great. Good, good flight. Was it a long flight? Uh, pretty long, yes. You're from the Woodcrest Church. Yes, ma'am. And tell us what you do in the church. I'm the youth pastor at the church. I work with the teenagers and uh, plan trips and different activities for the kids at the church. And... So you work with Daniel, and you've well, you've you've spoken to Daniel yes, about this that's trip. Correct. Yes, that's me. And and what made you choose to come to Ireland with a, with a group of teenagers? Well, we just. Uh, we were just looking for an opportunity to come over and visit uh, somebody that we knew, and uh, the kids love Ireland, so we thought it'd be a neat place to come visit. They I think they don't know Ireland yet. Now they'll love yes, it when they we we're done with them. Nobody's ever been here. <laughs> and what was it like when you were flying into Ireland? What did you think when it you looked out green, the window? It was green, beautiful green. We left. We actually had all of our school called off for snow yesterday, <gasps> so we haven't seen any That's green great. since last fall. <laughs> So we were pretty excited to see all the green, the lush green grass. And it's pretty different though, isn't beautiful, it? Beautiful, yes. It's, it's interesting, when you're flying into Ireland, that's one of the first images that you see when you look out. It's just green fields mm -hmm. everywhere. Patchwork yes. quilt. 
Yes. That's really what it, it's really what it looks like, doesn't it? So we're going to take them out there. We live up in the Roundwood area, and we'll be showing them uh, again out in the Glendalock area, down in the Dublin. And uh, wait, we're just sharing the word of God uh, with everybody that we meet, <laughs> really. And what's it going to be like looking after teenagers? Because I've been told sometimes large groupings of teenagers can be hard to we, manage. We actually have a great group of kids, honestly. Really? I'm not just saying that. They're they're just wonderful kids that I've never had a problem taking them different places. Oh, that's so they're lovely. They're really enjoyable to bring places. They're, they sing. We, we uh, have some songs that we'll do in the church services. Will they sing a song for us now? Sing grace, how sweet the sound. the youth group go on their merry way. It's an anxious wait for one passenger who was caught in possession of a large amount of cigarettes. Officers take the man in for further questioning to decide his faith. If you'd just like to take a seat here for me. Now, how many have we got there? One, two, three, four thousand, six hundred. We just do a quick check. The seizure reveals that the passenger was carrying 4,600 units of cigarettes, which far exceeds the permitted guidelines. Now it's up to the team to question the passenger further and prove they're not for personal consumption. We just targeted a man that we suspected was smuggling cigarettes in on a flight from Warsaw. This gentleman has a previous record with us, there's previous seizures made from him. He was identified and he was followed uh, from the time he landed uh, and disembarked from the aircraft. He was identified to officers in the channel who stopped him and searched his bags. When they searched his bags, they found 4,600 cigarettes and more than likely, it will result in the seizure of those cigarettes. The man was later released without charge. However, the cigarettes were seized. And finally, a week later, Cathy and Gary returned to the airport after their special trip to Ireland in celebration of her recovery from cancer. We caught up with them to see how they got on. Guys, we spotted you checking in, so you're back in the airport. Did you have a good week in Ireland? We had a great time, awesome time. It was an amazing trip. For your first time here, what were, you, what were your expectations and did it live up to the expectations? Oh, it exceeded the expectations. <laughs> the expectations were we would have a good trip, we'd have an enjoyable trip. I had no idea it could be this good. I mean, yeah. we stayed down in uh, Powers Court in Iscari and we went to a number of places. The people, incredibly polite, incredibly so nice. kind to yeah, us. So nice. The, and the food was just, the food was amazing. Mm -hmm. Every time we stopped to eat, it was amazing. Yeah, it was good. I mean, it is so beautiful. The weather was perfect. And just when every day was a little better than the day before. We did everything. I don't know what we didn't do. But at the same time, we didn't do so many things that we didn't have time to enjoy. Just the peace and serenity of, of Powers Court and Inniscary and Bray and really? everything. Everything was great. It was an amazing trip. You're going to have to come back and, of Absolutely. course, celebrate your good news. And how are you feeling? I feel great. And I, ho I hope we come back next year. I think it's just been great. So I think the reason why you were here, celebrating your good health and that mm -hmm. positive news, it it's so good that you've had a good time. Oh, yes. And it really makes you appreciate life, really. Oh, oh it does. It we've does. It was, we've, a number of people, we keep sending them updates every day. Yeah. And, you know, next year we'll come back with probably a a train load of people. <laughs> Try not to make it too crowded. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, I mean, the idea was to come over here for us to celebrate our good fortune because of mm -hmm. Kathy's health. And we have, we've got, not only did we get to do that, but we got to enjoy Ireland like yeah. we've never it expected. Blessing. Well, it's we such it. a positive story, Kathy, and I wish you good health and Thank happiness you. together. And I hope to see you next year and we'll perhaps the year after. We'll be here. Absolutely. We get ready to come over, we'll let you know. How's <laughs> yeah. that? But have a very safe trip home. Thank you so much. It was Thank lovely you. meeting you both. Thank you.
on our next visit to Dublin Airport. An anxious father waits on his daughter to arrive. When she told you that she was going to be studying away from home, how did you feel? How much is it going to cost me? Ladies let loose. <laughs> and love is in the air. You're the best boyfriend in the world. I want to ask for your hand in marriage. <laughs>